Released in 1976, Logan's Run tells the story of a strange future society who lives in a city under a dome. It's a city of total pleasure. The only catch is no one can live past the age of 30, where those who reach that age are killed off in a ceremony called Carousel. Logan 5, played by Michael York, is a Sandman, a hunter who kills runners who are those who are trying to escape Carousel. After Logan 5 meets a mysterious woman called Jessica 6, played by Jenny Agata, who plans to escape the Dome City to find a sanctuary world on the outside, Logan 5 now finds himself hunted and on the run in this surreal and sometimes psychedelic science fiction classic. So today we are going to look into 10 things that you didn't know about the often underrated science fiction movie Logan's Run. A movie where those who turn 30 must be terminated. <laughs> well, I'm well and truly screwed. <laughs> Let's check it out. Number 10, based on a book. Logan's Run is based on the book of the same name, which was published in 1967 by American writers William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Johnson in particular has many noticeable works in the realm of science fiction, having written several episodes of The Twilight Zone and the first episode of Star Trek. There are several differences between the book and movie. In the book, the cutoff age for its citizens was 21, unlike the movie where it was bumped up to 30. And the events of the book take place in 2126, whereas in the movie, the year is 2274. And the book has a different ending. Unlike the movie where the citizens flee the destroyed city to find the old man, where they learn that they can live outside and past the age 30, the novel sees the old man turning out to be Francis, and Logan and Jessica head out to a Mars colony in a rocket ship. Which is interesting. After the movie's release, there have been several sequel novels, none of which have been adapted onto the big or small screen. Not to mention the fact that the concept of Carousel was created purely for the movie. Number 9, Development Hell. The production of the Logan's Run theatrical movie started in 1969 when MGM decided to adapt the novel into a film after the success of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Planet of the Apes. The project was being overseen by producer George Powell, whom had previously produced several science fiction classics, like When Worlds Collide, War of the Worlds, and The Time Machine, and frequent James Bond script writer Richard Maybaum wrote a script. However, there was a conflict of interest with the script, with differing opinions on how the story should be told. Some people in the production thought the movie should reflect current issues of that time, so script rewrites took place. But at this time, producer George Powell felt that the new science fiction craze of 2001 and Planet of the Apes would have been dying down. So due to the production's delays, he left the project. American International Pictures offered to take over the production of Logan's Run for $200,000. And MGM said, nope, if you want to buy our script, it's going to cost you $350,000. And American International Pictures declined. And the Logan's Run production had continued to stall. It would take the power of another world to get Logan's Run back on track. A West World, if you will. Number 8. Other popular science fiction movies got Logan's Run back on track. So as the 70s went on, it would have seemed like the Logan's Run production was dead. However, in 1973, the release of two other movies would change that. Those being Soylent Green and Westworld. Both science fiction movies and both distributed by MGM. Both movies were popular and performed well in the box office. And MGM realized that there was still a place for science fiction. And that Logan's Run could be a hit riding off the success of Westworld and Soylent Green. So MGM put Logan's Run back into production in 1974. With a new screenplay by Straw Dog scriptwriter David Zelag Goodman. With Fantastic Voyage producer Sol David coming on board as producer. And Around the World in 80 Days director Michael Anderson being assigned to direct. Number 7, Michael York originally didn't want to star in Logan's Run. 
Although modern audiences may know British actor Michael York more for his role as Basil in the Austin Powers movies, in the early 70s he was a huge rising star, having appeared in Cabaret, The Free Musketeers and Murder on the Orient Express. So he was the production's number one choice to play the lead role of Logan 5 in Logan's Run. However, York originally didn't want to take on the role, feeling that it just wasn't right for him. However, a young theatre member who was assigned to be York's driver convinced him otherwise by frequently telling him to take the part, and on one occasion was even raising his finger at him, instructing York that he had to star in the movie as it's pressing buttons, pretty much telling York that he had to take on the part, so he did. Farrah Fawcett, who has a small but memorable role in Logan's run, got involved in the movie thanks to York himself, after he saw her at a tennis court and thought that she was hot where he then suggested her to the production, where she was then subsequently cast, and just after the release of Logan's Run, she found big success in the Charlie's Angels TV show. But hey, it was the 70s, a time when someone could be cast in a movie because someone saw them walking on a tennis court. Number six, one of the cast members dropped out. Actor William Devane, who also starred in The Marathon Man at that time, was cast in the role of Francis Seven, Logan Five's friend and fellow Sandman turned foe. But before filming started, he left the project to star in the Alfred Hitchcock movie Family Plot instead. So actor Richard Jordan took his place and was cast as Francis Five. Jordan had previously starred in the movie Rooster Cogburn, and would later go on to star in fellow science fiction epic Dune. Filming of Logan's Run would go on to take place at MGM Studios in Culver City, California, and some scenes were also filmed inside buildings in Dallas, such as a restaurant, a nightclub, a shopping mall, etc. There were issues with some of the special effects, like trying to hide the wires during the carousel scene, which, yeah, you can see the wires, unfortunately. And for some scenes, new hologram technology had to be created. Nine sound stages were used in total, and the miniature set that we see of the city was the biggest of its time. Number five, most of the cast was over 30. So considering a major plot of the movie is a future society where no one over 30 can live, the cast sure was made up of mostly over 30 year olds. Michael York, Richard Johnson, and Michael Anderson Jr. were all over 30. York was 33 at the time of filming, and because of York's casting, it was decided to make 30 the forbidden age where renewal must take place, unlike the book where it was 21. In fact, Richard Jordan was more close to 40 during the movie's shoot, with him being 38 at the time. Farrah Fawcett just made the cut as she was 29 at the time of filming. The only other star who was the correct age was Jenny Agata, who was 23 at the time of the movie's shoot. And damn, when I saw this film as a kid, I completely fell in love with Agatha. It must have had something to do with that costume. Incidentally, Agatha did not like wearing that costume at all. But regardless, it's just funny that how in a movie where no one is allowed to be 30, only two of the main cast members were actually under 30. Number four, the screen test led to changes being made. The post-production stage of Logan's run took eight months, and in this time, movie scoring legend Jerry Goldsmith conducted the music. His score in Logan's run is sensational. Some of the more high-tech sounds he uses do sound a little outdated now, but his actual orchestral music sounds like an insight of what was to come, as it has that distinct magical Goldsmith sound that would become commonplace for his themes in the late 70s and 80s. After screening the movie for test audiences, several cuts were made to Logan's run, including extended scenes of nudity in order for the movie to get a PG rating, and other trims and cuts had to be made in order to keep the duration down. There was an entire sequence removed, where the Francis character is hunting down a runner all by himself, where the surrounding bystanders then cheer. The sequence was to take place at the start of the movie and there were additional scenes cut from the New You Facial Reconstruction Clinic. These are just some of the scenes that were removed from the final film. Some of the deleted footage would go on to make it as a bonus feature on home media releases. However, a lot of the deleted footage appears to be lost. But who knows, maybe it will turn up one day in a vault somewhere in the MGM archives. And I cannot stress enough just how much I love the Jerry Goldsmith score for Logan's Run. It is a must-have for all Goldsmith fans. Number 3, Comic Book. In 1977, Marvel Comics released a series of comic books based on Logan's Run. 
The comics were bright and colourful and full of action-packed visuals, keeping true to the look of the movie. Some of the comics were drawn by George Perez, whom had previously illustrated for comics like The Avengers, Wonder Woman and Teen Titans, and I think it's the illustrations that is the highlight of the comic saga, as the illustrations are full of detail and look really exciting. Seriously, the covers alone look really epic. However, despite having, quote, acceptable sales, the comic was cancelled after its seventh issue. Regardless, there was a comic book revival in 1990 with a new Logan's Run comic series by Adventure Comics, which was followed by a sequel series called Logan's World, as well as another revival in 2010 by Blue Water Comics. Number 2. TV Series Logan's Run got a TV series spin-off, which was broadcast on CBS and only lasted for 14 episodes before being cancelled with it being broadcast from late 1977 to early 1978. And yes, it suffers the same fate as most TV shows based on movies. It recasts the characters from the film, which to me always stands out like a sore thumb, as they are trying to make the characters look like their movie counterparts, but to me they look more like imposters. The show was off to a rough start from the get-go when the pilot was filmed, which was basically a retelling of the movie and CBS wanted changes made to the story, which led to reshoots. Despite the pilot being written by William F. Nolan, one of the writers who wrote the original novel. In fact, rewrites were a common thing for this series. Star Trek scriptwriter David Gerald wrote a script, which was so heavily changed and altered, for the credits he went under the pseudonym name Noah Ward, on the account that Noah Ward sounded like No Award. What's even more interesting is Sol David, who was the producer of the movie, came on board as the TV show's producer, but was ultimately fired. So it seems the show's production just couldn't find its fitting, and it sounds like there was probably too many cooks in the kitchen with too many different ideas. Hence, the TV show didn't catch on and slipped into obscurity. Once again, as often is the case with TV shows based on movies. Number one, the end of an era in science fiction. The original budget for Logan's run was set to be $3 million, but it escalated to about $8 to $9 million, making Logan's run MGM's most expensive movie that it had made in 10 years of that time. Logan's run was released in June 1976 and would go on to make $23 million, making the movie profitable and helping MGM to get out of debt. Despite winning an Academy Award for special effects and going on to be a science fiction masterpiece, the reviews for Logan's run were pretty dismal, with claims that the movie was silly and underneath its razzle-dazzle, it's just another science fiction movie about a post-apocalyptic society from the future. However, something was happening in the world of science fiction at that time, something that would come along and change the genre forever. That, of course, was Star Wars. Just under a year after the release of Logan's Run, Star Wars had hit theatres and was a movie like no other. It was an optimistic, out-of-this-world adventure, full of hope and wonder and optimism with memorable characters and special effects no one had seen the likes of for its time. Star Wars completely changed the face of science fiction, and science fiction movies that preceded it followed in its footsteps. So Logan's run really is the last of its kind, the final hurrah of a bygone era of science fiction. In the late 60s to mid 70s, science fiction movies had become about dysfunctional futuristic societies, full of death and destruction, often caused by corruption of technology and or government. Good usually did triumph, but it was a triumph through pessimism. And Logan's run was the final movie to follow this template before things radically changed the following year. Logan's run was the calm before the storm that was Star Wars. However, in later years, people would go back to Logan's run and appreciate it for its themes and philosophical storytelling and its ideas, and for what the movie was trying to achieve for its time. It's a must watch for all lovers of science fiction. It's a relic of 1970s science fiction, at a time when science fiction was about to change, but that doesn't make it any less awe-inspiring. Yeah, Logan's run looks old and dated now and has a real 1970s kish look about it. But to me, that's part of the charm. The fact that it looks so old school and retro and looks like nothing that would be made nowadays actually adds to the feeling of it being otherworldly. So all fans of science fiction cinema should check out Logan's run. Anyway, I'm Minty, and if you're over 30 and ever find yourself in a futuristic dome city, don't tell anyone how old you are, or otherwise it's carousel time for you. See ya!